Is it possible to gamify your music promotion and make it more fun for your fans to fall in love with your newest songs? Well, for thousands of years, artists have been mixing media to make more immersive and connective worlds. And in today's episode, we're going to hear about a very 21st century example of that. We're going to hear from Emma McGann, who has tied together her original songs, 3D graphics, elements of live streaming and video game culture to create something called the MonsterVerse, which is simultaneously a virtual world an album, and a multiplayer role-playing game on Discord. It's super creative, it's super fun. I'm sure it took a lot of work. So I'm excited today to talk to Emma again. You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY. DIY. Oh. Musician. <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> Hey, what's up? Welcome to episode 326 of the DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Chris Raleigh, and today I'm excited to talk to Emma McGann about the MonsterVerse, which, as I said, is uh, something that combines Twitch and Discord and musical recordings and video to make a really immersive world and just a really cool way to promote new music. But before we get into that, I just have two quick bits of news. One is that CD Baby's limited time offer of $4.99 distribution is still going. Yes, it's limited, but You've still got a little bit of time to take advantage of $4.99 worldwide distribution for a single or album. It includes a free UPC barcode, social video monetization, sync licensing, and a whole bunch more. Second, if you've ever attended one of our DIY musician conferences, you will definitely want to be on the lookout for an email from us. And this is a little bit of a vague teaser, but basically this spring, we're going to be doing something very cool, similar to the conference, but on a smaller, more intimate scale with limited attendance. And what that will mean is you'll get more access to the speakers, more sort of small group mentorship. It's going to be great. It's going to be three days and where it is and when it is. We'll make an official announcement soon and that'll have way more details. But basically make sure you're on CD Baby's list because that's where we're going to make the announcement. And as I said, attendance is limited. So you'll want to be one of the first people to grab tickets to make sure you can reserve your spot. Okay, our guest today is Emma McGann, and Emma is a very talented songwriter who bridges the worlds of folk, pop, rock, and electronic music. And I first met Emma probably four or five years ago at the DIY Musician Conference in Valencia, Spain. I think it was the one right before COVID. And uh, Rich Orchard, who works on our team at CD Baby, introduced uh, us to Emma and brought her as a guest for the conference. And we went out to dinner that night, and I think I talked her ear off and asked her a thousand questions about live streaming, which at the time she was doing at a level I'd really never seen an indie artist do before in terms of just quality of the production, size of the impact and growing her audience. And it was just really amazing. And I could tell she was someone who was both talented, but also an extremely hard worker, not afraid to dig in and sort of tie all the tech together. And as I said earlier, make a more immersive experience for her audience. In the years since then, over the pandemic, and most recently with this MonsterVerse project, she's really taken all of that to a whole new level. So let's talk about it. Here's Emma again. Hey, Emma, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. You know, I had a sneaking suspicion that your live stream video setup would be about 10,000 times better than mine. So <laughs> thanks for living up to my expectation. I know. I think mine's a little over OTT sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's great. Um, so I am really excited to talk to you about the whole MonsterVerse project. But I think for listeners, can we do a bit of the backstory of, you know, anything you think people should know about your music or your life, maybe up to the point where you started taking live streaming uh, really seriously? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm a UK singer songwriter. I have kind of always written songs since I was about 10 years old and just naturally followed that thread of wanting to make something out of it as a kind of career. So naturally kind of fell into the pool of studying music at university. Um, I started kind of uh, hosting showcases in the local city where I'm from uh, to kind of network with other artists really. Um, and to, you know, use like provide a platform for other people. And then um, kind of around the same time I was studying, I started kind of independently touring around the UK and started trying trying to I guess cut my teeth as an mm. artist uh, just me acoustic guitar and um, it proved to be very um, difficult and it was a big big struggle uh, at the very very beginning and so I started looking into different options where um, you know it would be a financial financially viable route for me to you know keep doing what I loved years down the line so I started kind of tying in like the traditional means of doing things as an artist with 
this online world, which back in, uh, I guess, 2010, 2011, the concept of live streaming was very much non-existent for most people. It wasn't kind of um, embedded into the social platforms we use today. Um, I think back then maybe live streaming was associated with webcam sites that maybe not everybody would be on, but then, and Remember I don't know. Roulette? Yeah, chat roulette, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> so like you wouldn't often find musicians there. So uh, a friend of mine recommended a platform called You Now To Me way back then and said, hey, the it has like a, a big kind of American demographic on there. I think your music would maybe, you know, really fit into that market. I was like, okay, sure. So jumped on and there was hardly any musicians on there, maybe one or two. And just like from there, that on, it just kind of forked into all these wild opportunities that um, so many di different weird and wonderful doors that have opened for me since. But it, it's de it definitely made me see the value in that format of content um, as a musician. And so I kind of just picked it up, ran with it and tried, have tried my best along the way to kind of advocate for that space and um, show the benefits that it can bring for some artists if, if it's a, you know, a place where they want to work it into their strategy. Yeah. So well, what do you think those benefits are? Because I was going to ask you basically what clicked for you once you got in there and like, what do you think about that experience drew your audience closer to you? I think like first jumping into it back when I started using uh, the first platform I was on, there wasn't any kind of monetary gain. Uh, monetization back then wasn't a thing on live streaming platforms like the one I was on until about a month into using it. Uh, they kind of partnered me. Um, so the the financial aspect wasn't the first port of call. Um, it was the audience growth and the kind of outreach for a pocket of people who I haven't reached with my music yet. So the one thing I say to people, like artists, is like your first question should never be how much money can I make from this. It should be like how um, how how big an audience can I grow from from something like this. Um, yeah, I've always kind of seen it as a tool to kind of um, bring an audience together around a common interest. If that's music, if that's gaming, it works for different people for, in different ways. But um, yeah, it's been really powerful. And then the money bit comes later. <laughs> well, I think uh, don't think about the money first is good good advice for any aspect of the music industry, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, well, so, um, you know, we don't have to dwell too much on the live streaming thing. Um, but I am curious, like if you had tips for people who are trying to take it seriously, like first, what are some of the bigger challenges maybe you faced and how you address them? And then just like any kind of general advice you give artists. Yeah, I think um, for anybody that's not used to it, this and I felt myself like regurgitating this info over the pandemic, it's just like not always a natural feeling to be in front of a camera for an extended period of time. You might be used to kind of doing uh, edited kind of uh, you to camera pieces for YouTube or something like that. But when it's one to many in a live space, it's like it can be a very vulnerable feeling. Um, so you do like have to get used to that. And I think the best way to do that is to just be yourself and kind of accept very early on that um, that environment, it, it's, there's mistakes are gonna happen. It's uh, one of the um, fun and not so fun factors about it, but your audience get to see you for who you are. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I kind of like the kind of spontaneity it kind of leads to as well. Like sometimes um, you, you go off script just all the time. And it's, well, I say go off script, there's no script. Um, to start to go with <laughs> go off in the, in the first place yeah so it's it's a really good opportunity to allow people to just see you for you i like to this day i still call it the most human form of social media we have um yeah. because you just you know people see you for all of your mistakes and all of your best parts too so. yeah i mean my sense of it and you could confirm or deny this but it it has always seemed to me like a place where the audiences are very forgiving and maybe that's not even the right word but like accepting rather of of flaws and of quirkiness and all that do you you found that true yeah i think it depends how how what you do <laughs> i mean there's definitely been some cases within the space where you know there's been streamers who have said uh pretty terrible things or done pretty terrible things but yeah i think <laughs> for the most part it from a musician point of view you know, if you play a dud note, it's okay. They're not going to leave. <laughs> like, they do see you for who you, like, you know, just you in the moment, I guess. And they are accepting of that. As long as you don't have a meltdown on camera. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to do that. 
Oh, the last thing I wanted to ask you on, on the live streaming uh, bit is if, if you had to summarize, how has your live streaming habits or whatever changed from uh, pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and post-pandemic? Was there much drastic difference? Yeah, there was definitely... Um it was kind of predictable that there'd be an uptick in just like saturation in the space during the pandemic. So like the way I looked at it was that um, I knew that would drop off and tail off at the, at the end. And I already had a kind of um, formula and format that was working for me. Um, so I didn't want to change too much. Um, number one for fear of, you know, alienating my existing audience, mm -hmm. but also I saw it as an opportunity to, to go live more to um, reach new audiences outside of music music as well. So kind of uh, tying in some of my interests outside of music, like gaming and things like that. Um, I, the, the, my kind of philosophy around not just live streaming, but just content in general and being online is like the more you're visible, the the more people you're going to reach. If the, if the line's not in the water, you're not going to catch any fish. Right. So um, I think one, th one, other tip I'd say to people is if you can keep a schedule that is consistent, whether that's with live streaming or any of the content um, where you are visible for that period of time, um, then it's always a good thing to kind of have in place. And yeah, I mean, during the pandemic, I went, definitely went live more because my thought was there's going to be more eyes in this space mm -hmm. at this certain at period of time. If I'm going to up my uh, hours into into live streaming and this is the time to do it and it worked well um and it was it was interesting to see kind of post pandemic um how many musicians did actually stay in that space as well um from people that I'd kind of um helped tutor through the pandemic and stuff so um I think maybe it, sh it shone a light in the space where it's like this is a, a great, some people saw it as a kind of very temporary thing, which is fine. And I think it, it fed its purpose for those people, for those reasons, uh, for musicians who wanted to tour. But I think it also uh, struck a chord with a lot of people who weren't used to it before and maybe encouraged them to feed parts of it into their own kind of strategy, perhaps not as um, extreme as I have it in mind. But um, yeah, I, th I think it, it, there's positive things that kind of came from it, I think, for a lot of people during that time. Well, when you said that you started incorporating other interests and interest groups in your li into your live streams, was that as elements or as segments of your sort of primarily music thing? Or did you start kind of making separate broadcasts for different reasons? A little bit of both, really. Like sometimes I'd kind of tie it into my existing stream. So that existing audience that would be there for the music could choose to stay on for an extra two hours to play a new game or something like that. Uh -huh. um, one thing I would say is like people who get used to you you for a certain thing uh if you do start a, a different category of whether this is on youtube for just videos in general or if it's on in a live like space people do get used to the content they're used to you seeing you do so when you suddenly do something different it can be a bit jarring for your existing audience um but the way to look at it really is um the um the ones who want to watch and stick around they can and then it, it, but it's not really about that. It's about pulling in a new audience. So yeah, I I did a little bit of both. I did dedicated streams for um for different different games, and then I just kind of tie in tie in the two as well. Especially if it was a game that I felt like kind of filled the space quite well. Mm -hmm. Well, so speaking of games, like uh, my sense of the MonsterVerse experience is that it might have been heavily inspired by that relationship between Twitch and gaming and Discord and that sort of whole environment. But I also sort of assume that a lot of our listeners aren't in that world. So if you can tolerate doing like kind of a one-on-one on those platforms, like can you tell people like a little bit about the basic culture of Twitch, maybe some of its features, things like raids and, and kind of just the gamification of how that works. And, and then yeah, we can get sure. into Discord later, but yeah, let's start with Twitch. Yeah, sure. So Twitch, I, I would say for musicians, you got to think of Twitch as like a, a predominantly it's for for gamers, right? It, it's a gaming uh, platform, and it, what's been really encouraging over the years is that uh, the music category has just kind of blossomed and bloated up into this huge network of like really talented people. Um, so I would say like a part of the culture of Twitch for musicians really is that we have a shared audience there, um, and like g speaking on the kind of raid feature, um, it's almost like um, imagine you're you're at a show and the venue you're in has a venue right next door and the show's happening at the same time and at the end of one show 
the guy on the mic says, okay, everybody go next door and we're going to show some love to this band. It's kind of like doing that. So you have, you very much have a shared audience and um, it's a great way of kind of cross pollinating mm -hmm. um, uh, like fans, which is really, really cool. And it's, it becomes a supportive network in that way for the musicians. So that's a huge part of the culture, especially within the music musician community, I think there. Um, it's just very, very kind of open and supportive. And I guess as a kind of um, the, the gamification that's like kind of embedded in Twitch um, in terms of like, you know, the bits and just all the different bells and whistles that it has. I mean, it's all to the benefit of the streamer and you can choose to use or shout about whatever uh, would benefit you. There's so many different uh, kind of formats that you can run with as well. Like um, one thing I love about it really uh, from a, from from my perspective is uh, I love to offer an environment where my viewers can interact with the space behind me. So uh, the kind of jungle that you see behind me, they get to kind of change the, if I can change them right now, just to kind of show you, they get to kind of pick the light scenes, but uh -huh. they can use their kind of in, uh, in Twitch channel points that they accumulate by just watching a stream uh, to do that. So I like that kind of element of them having the option to, um, to be a hand in the lighting engineering of the show, if that makes sense. So I kind of like, um, I've always liked the, the um, I guess the perspective Twitch has on the back end uh, in terms of what they expect their viewers to want from their streamers. Um, there's a lot of features that I think could be like added, but also the ones that are existing just allow you to do so many different things. Um, especially if you've got, if you're creative and you have your own ideas, you can run with it in so many different ways. Yeah. Well, speaking as a bit of a Twitch idiot, I know in the first time I went on there, it was um, overwhelming. There's so much going on on screen that is driven by the viewer, not necessarily, um, all to do with the with the live streamer, um, which is a very different experience from you know whatever live streaming on Facebook or YouTube, which is a, a more static environment. Yeah. It's more presentational, and I thought, well, one, I was very intimidated by the kind of the clutter of it all, um, yeah. but then to a much greater degree, it's cool that the viewer can really participate. Um, so, um, I guess all that to then ask you. What is the relationship between Discord and Twitch? And were you kind of using that prior to ha anything having to do with the MonsterVerse? Yeah, so I've used Discord for a really long time. And um, as far as I understand, Discord um, started out, for, again, it was very much uh, gaming centric. So it's basically a place, uh, a platform online where you can host your community away from the existing platforms you use for maybe live streaming or content. So the way I like to kind of describe it, it's almost like, uh, a forum um, imagine you hosted a forum on, on your website where again everybody who is there has a common interest and that's you and your music it's an opportunity for them to not just like click on different pages on your website to see what's going on but to actually interact and talk to one another and get to know one another as well so it's it's quite powerful in that your community are there and they're in the thick of it they can talk to you they can also talk to everybody else in there who has that common interest, which is your music, or whatever it is your Discord server is about. Um, so yeah, that's how I like to kind of describe it to people, or that's how I've always found myself describing it anyway. It can be, um, I found it overwhelming to kind of get used to, but mm -hmm. um, after using it for God knows how many years now, it's it feels just like another platform. It's a different user interface to anything you're, I think most people are typically used to uh, across like social media, typical platforms. So it just get take a little bit of getting used to. It might seem a bit clunky. It did to me <laughs> at the yeah, beginning. Me too. But, um, yeah. Yeah. I've but used it. Uh, I've used it for about a year now with some music industry groups, some investment group, you know, niche interest groups. And I think of it, have you ever used Slack? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like a more fun, perhaps slightly more social version of Slack to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very much based on like text thread type. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, like another sense I have of using Discord for, uh, or, or, or musicians who use it is um, you don't probably don't expect all of your audience to be there. So it's this way of kind of drawing in the most uh, diehard, the most engaged. Is that has that been true for you? Yeah, definitely. I kind of see Discord as um, a place to direct the, especially the people on Twitch, 
um, a place to direct them where they can um, kind of continue being a part of the community outside of the streams when I'm not necessarily there. So whatever conversations we've had on stream uh, or whatever songs they want to hear from me in the future, they can carry that conversation across there, but also just have conversations of their own. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's, it's an important thing to have as an artist, whether you host it on Discord or somewhere else, because it kind of, I think it, well, this is the feeling I get from being in other people's discord of artists that I love is that you feel like you, you are a part of that community in a very, uh, in a, in a verbal way, in a very active way. Um, and it's not, you're not just being fed into a place where you're just going to be like, Oh, buy my merch, buy this, buy that. It's not all about that. It's also about you as an individual and what you've got going on and who you are. And, um, so in my discord server, I have, and in many people's discord servers, um, you can categorically like have different channels that are meant for different types of conversations. So um, we have one dedicated uh, to introduce yourself. So you can, if you're brand new in the server, introduce a little bit about yourself, your projects. So I encourage people to share what they've got going on as well. Um, then we have fun things like pet pictures, like show me all of your pet pictures. Um, it's mandatory. <laughs> Please show me all of them. Um, and just, you know, fun things like that. Um, and then, of course, we have the music updates and the music conversation and everything else. And, of course, the monster burst related things. So it's I, the way I look at it is it's um, a kind of secondary place to um, uh, direct the audience. Um, so the primary place for me is my website. Go to my website, sign up to the mailing list. Secondary is um, Discord where, you know, you can just um, continue that conversation yeah um speaking of the pet pictures i've seen artists do like um theme of the day sorts of stuff so wednesday might be show me your dog picture thursday could be you know what did you eat today whatever but it's a, like a cool way of just giving people something new to do every day yeah it's really, really cool. cool um i also think for our listeners we should probably just define some basic discord terms if that's cool with you uh you you said server and server is sort of your um, the equivalent of maybe a, a profile or it's sort of your domain on discord that has to do with you. And then, yeah, it's kind yeah. of like your for forum, something like that. That's yeah. What I simulate it too. And then channels are kind of like what um, sub sub discussion group sort of. Yes. Um, and then how about like things like boosts and bots and maybe some other things you might talk about later. <laughs> Yeah, so like boosts are um, something that your uh, community can they can pay to boost your boost your server, and it will give uh, your server different perks. So you might be able to um, be able to add a different banner for the whole because it's not very decorative. I would say Discord it's very plain, like you uh -huh. say. Um, so boosts can give you like a banner for your um, for your Discord and things like that. Um, some some cosmetic things, and then um, stuff like bots are. Uh, I would say like third party things that you can bring into discord. Um, so for example, like the bot, which I'm sure we'll talk about later that we, we kind of made um, was very much a kind of third party thing that we brought into discord. So you can have things like um, if you have a, like a voice chat uh, with fans, you can have like um, a bot that just plays music in the background that people can queue up songs in. And there's just like so many different bots. So if, anybody out there is new to discord like do some research into bots that you can add in because there's just so many different uh categories and kind of themes that you can run with there um yeah yeah i, I know one of the most sort of basic bots is the one where it just auto populates a, ch a channel with uh, your social posts so it could be like a twitter bot so anytime you tweet it just automatically goes to discord as well yeah um, so I, I think you already addressed kind of how you've been using discord prior to the monsterverse but i just want now that we get to this section, I want to read a quote from your website. Okay. Monsterverse RPG is a free multiplayer role-playing game, Discord bot, where players can battle monsters, unlock rare items, and level up the community leaderboards. What does that all mean? It sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It sounds, Tell me more. It sounds overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it stemmed from... Um, Again, it's kind of stemmed from my own interest of gaming and stuff. And last year and during the pandemic, me and a few friends were kind of playing this. It was a Discord bot and it was text-based and it was, an, it was a role-playing game. And I mean, I've played plenty of like role-playing games uh, as, as a kid growing up and stuff like that. And um, I just loved how immersive it was um, as, uh, as like a character in, the, in, in a story. Um, 
And as I was playing over the a course of about like a week or two, I was thinking, how cool would this be if we could make something like this and create this activation around the new EP where it's just an additional immersive element that, you know, people can just choose to jump into if they want. So not necessarily anything that has a monetary gain to it, but just something additional that um, I guess enhances that experience of the story behind the, the EP, right? So um, it is very much a, a text-based game that you can only play in Discord in my server currently. And um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely... Um, uh, inspired in, in terms of the monster verse just in general it's inspired by this kind of supernatural theme of like fighting off demons and monsters and uh, follows i guess like somebody explained it to me the other day a friend of mine who tried it for the first time who was not um, a gamer in any sense of the word um she said it it was very much like uh, and what she'd expect any video game uh, concept to be like, just, you know, battling through monsters, leveling up your character and stuff like that. So um, it positions um, you at the center of the story uh, as the player and you can collect uh, different items along the way. You kind of flow through. Um, it's almost like a choose your own adventure type um, scenario where um, you flow through the story and the levels of the monster verse uh, in order to kind of come out on the other end. And um, it also, it's, it's almost like a supportive, um, immersive uh, element to the whole EP that I guess brings more context to the, both the music videos and the music if people want to not just dip their toes in, but go in like super deep and uh, just have fun. And it's also like a kind of community thing as well. Um, it's a, a multiplayer kind of thing where I encourage a bit of uh, friendly competition where we have leaderboards where like it looks at how much gold people have made in game mm -hmm. or, um, you know, how many uh, monster battles they've won and things like that. So, yeah, it's very much a community driven uh, fun element that um, I'm really happy that we brought into the Discord server. Yeah, it's it's such a cool idea. The um, Did you ever read those choose your own adventure books from like, I don't know, the 80s or whenever they were written? I did. And like, um, I, I can't remember what the one I had one as a kid. And then maybe in like 2006, 2007, I attempted, I didn't finish it because it was a mammoth project. But I was on YouTube at that time. And I was trying to create a choose your own adventure back then with some really crude drawings that I just scanned <laughs> into my PC uh, with like subtitles on and stuff. Yeah, I love that kind of, kind of uh, the variance you know, you know, like on Netflix these days, they they're producing shows where you can choose your own adventure and stuff like yep, that. Yeah, totally. The um, love it. What was the Black Mirror movie called? Um, oh God, yeah, I know the one you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was imagine when you were describing that, I was imagining like a bunch of people sitting in a room together, like all reading the same choose your own adventure book, but like taking different paths. Yeah, from yeah, and I guess like uh, from my Discord and uh, point of view in, in terms of what that experience is like. You can also choose to sit back and watch another player play as well. So you kind of get the thread of all the actions they're doing and whether they get killed or not, mm -hmm. <laughs> or like uh, if they lose an item, if they get so far and then unfortunately they lose like the best item they've ever picked up, wasn't it? It's, it's <laughs> quite unforgiving actually. Some oh, that's the, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so worth returning to then. Well, I'm curious, you, you mentioned this a little bit, but like, I'm curious if you have any specific thoughts around um, tying the arc of the game or the plot or through line specifically to kind of the unveiling of the music in a certain order and maybe how you conceptualize the, the game flow um, as well as sort of why you envision it as this thing that the, 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 the player is at the center of rather than it being this thing where the artist is usually at the center of, of their work. Yeah. Um, so the, the songs came first with the, with the whole project um, and the kind of umbrella theme of the monster versus um, it's a big metaphor for fighting off your facing your monsters and fighting off your inner demons. Um, and so it was very much centered around uh, anxiety and not so great feelings. Um, but I was kind of searching for a metaphor that would um, kind of illustrate that in I mean, how else would you visualize your monsters? It's a supernatural way, right? So I started to kind of draw references from um, TV shows and games that I used to play as a kid. So like uh, shows like 
Charmed and Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel and and like games like Tomb Raider and um, it got me to thinking like why was it that I was so drawn to those types of like supernatural shows was it because I, I saw a part of myself in that story so that was what brought me around to the conclusion that whatever uh, theme I wanted to run with I wanted to place the listener um, for the songs and the viewer of the music videos and the player of the game at the center of the story as the main character as the hero so um, while the kind of story and the lyric lyrics and the meaning of the songs refer to like my own kind of experiences um, perhaps they see a part of themselves in that story and they can fit into my shoes and you know kind of experience it like that I, I was really intrigued um, to kind of you know create a project where I wasn't visually um, just there um, as well I feel like um, the only part of this whole EP campaign where I had a, a visible uh, kind of moment was um, I created a bit for um, just social and it was almost like a, it was a promo for the EP and uh, I was almost like a customs officer, like uh, checking in people to go into the monster verse before they jump through the portal and stuff. So it was it was really fun to kind of just focus completely on creative and not necessarily the the photo shoots and, and the music videos for me as the artist. So it was really fun to center those um, those listeners in the in the very thick of it, I guess. Yeah, you know, I, I hadn't thought of that. I suppose it's so obvious now that you say it, but even in the videos themselves, it's the viewer perspective of uh, sort of traveling around, wandering around and seeing the monsters, but it's all it's all very first person in a way. And, and now I feel dumb for even not getting that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, speaking of the videos, though, um, I know you used some um, sort of 3D modeling stuff for all of that. Do you want to? Give us a rundown on what that, that sounds like a bunch of work. Yeah, I mean, it all kind of, um, I've always had a huge interest in animation just in general. And um, during the pandemic, I kind of jumped into it a little bit more um, from a 3D perspective as well. I'd always done kind of 2D animation just as a kind of hobbyist. Um, I've done it in previous videos, music videos for like songs like Teary Eyed and stuff like that. But I wanted to do something um, that I'd never done before. I had plenty of time in the pandemic to learn something a bit new. So um, I used Blender for all the 3D models that you see in the uh, music videos for the MonsterVerse. Um, very much a beginner over here in terms of any form of 3D modeling. I mean, I have a pottery wheel at home that I attempt occasionally, <laughs> um, maybe bi yearly. Um, but yeah, um, it it was a uh, it's a bit of a steep learning curve. But if you you know have a big imagination and the time to sit down and learn, which which I did in the pandemic, then yeah, I I. I I learned very early on that it was it was definitely something I wanted to kind of like experiment with. And um, around that same time, uh, we picked up a motion capture uh, suit as well, um, just to kind of toy around with this idea of virtual avatars. And um, because I'm so in that kind of live streaming space and I was seeing um, the this kind of potential for like, um, what would it be like if you created a, like a musician virtual avatar um i was like let's let's give it a go and see how easy it is and how accessible you know it is and meta humans just kind of became a thing and so we were kind of just experimenting it was a big sandbox moment for us to um to see what we could do um as alternative content really and it kind of bled into this idea of the MonsterVerse. And I was just like, well, we experimented with virtual avatars last last year. Let's use that same technology for this um, this new project, but in a new way. Why don't, instead of, you know, me just singing about my monsters, um, instead of hiring um, special effects uh, studio houses to make a music video, why don't we just do it from my living room? I'll animate the monsters and if it looks janky, that's okay. Like <laughs> we'll, uh, it, it will be a learning moment. So yeah, it was, um, and I've always, like I say, I've always had that kind of um, natural interest in just animation and um, Unreal Engine is um, really powerful. And it's only been in the last like a uh, couple of years where I've really seen the, just the benefits of it, especially if you have like a PC that can, PC specs that can handle the renders and stuff. So um and not just for music videos, but for just like social content in general, 
so yeah i mean it's definitely a steep learning curve but the pandemic definitely allowed me to jump in a little deeper if i could if people can climb that learning curve is and do the work themselves is it a, is it a pretty affordable program or process or set of technologies so unreal engine's free um it's completely free as is blender totally totally free um the mocap suit that i have is um, by a company called Rococo. I would say it's in terms of price, it's probably the most one of the most accessible on the market. I mean, motion capture suits, unless they were very homemade, they weren't really on the market up until, you know, maybe, well, not very, they haven't been on the market for a, a long time anyway. Mm. And um, not ones that are decent anyway. So yeah, um, I think that one um, was around 12 to 1500 for that motion capture suit. Um, that we ended up using in different projects outside of music. Um, so in terms of affordability, the motion capture suit was the most expensive thing. And then, yeah, the software is just free. I mean, again, it comes down to the PC um, specs of things. Um, I'm currently working on a kind of behind the scenes video of like how the MonsterVerse kind of kind of came to be um, and where I list all of the PC specs that I ran with. But yeah, it's... Um, it's but but I mean that, that's what I've been kind of trying to um try trying to run with you know like this um this idea that okay everything else is like it's completely free if I can run with like a budget of maybe 150 pounds on 3D models that I might use in the videos then it's probably definitely worthwhile you know so yeah I'm laughing because I think you're putting artists most artists to shame when they think about you know uh acquiring new skills and stuff. You, during the pandemic, I learned how to use Discord and you know, <laughs> get out 3D modeling and all that's, it's, it's impressive. <laughs> um, the, uh, the next thing I wanted to ask you about is sort of um, how you spun moments from this MonsterVerse experience or, or moments from your live stream just into smaller social content. Cause I know there was like a, a, a clip of a live stream where a portal opens behind you and just a, do you have advice or, or tips about, you know, cutting up your content for social, basically? Yeah. I mean, one thing I'll say about Twitch is that, um, again, talking about their features and like um, what they have natively inbuilt into the platform, which you can use while you're live, um, you can just like quickly clip uh, different things and have it set up on a stream deck where it's like, oh, OK, that was that was a good take of that song or whatever. And you can clip or if there's a funny moment, right? So you don't have to go back in and find the moment and edit and stuff. So um, Twitch is kind of built with that in mind in terms of recycl recyclable content, mm -hmm. um, which is really, really great. Um, and what I wanted to do for Halloween last year um, and what I've wanted to do for a few years now, <laughs> a lot of my live streams are very kind of casual in terms of the environment. It's um, nothing too apart from the backdrop it's nothing too overly produced it's just me and an acoustic guitar and so my audience are used to that and it's usually you know pop songs folk songs rock songs and and not a whole lot else it's just me singing so for Halloween I wanted to kind of um, give them a bit of a shock moment um, and uh, so we kind of fabricated this shot where and it was a pre-recorded um video of like this this portal that would appear behind me um on one of the camera shots and it was it was kind of like um it took people by surprise because they were just like what is going on like just sat there with the guitar and it appears kind of thing um, although you do play it up in the beginning you're like did you hear that what was that and so suddenly <laughs> everyone's attuned to something going wrong or or it's yeah. yeah so we uh, we were trying to figure out like a really good segue um to to take people into the monster verse, but just on screen in a live stream. So the idea was that this portal appears. I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? It's ha actually happening kind of thing. Um, and then I kind of pick up my phone and like change the stream to my phone camera and they jump through the portal with me. And then suddenly it's a promo for the, the EP itself. And there's footage from as if you're in the monster verse and it's that first person point of view. So yeah, it was a bit of a kind of shock factor moment that we wanted to kind of um, rock the boat with. Um, 
especially we were on the front page of Twitch at the time as well. So we had a higher viewership uh, than usual. And also it was Halloween and I was just like, we've got an EP to promote. I'm going to go wild with it and have some fun. So yeah, it was, it was interesting. It made for some really cool uh, uh, content to share on social too. So just to return to Twitch for a sec, was that something you had lined up with them? So you knew you'd be on the, so, so there was sort of that synchronicity of attention or is ending up on the front page more of an accident of how many people are watching? Uh, so I had um, I was a part of a, a program that they ran recently to highlight female creators on the platform, which was really great. So uh, they did that over the period of about three months. Um, so I had like scheduled slots every oh, cool. uh, every, every week, which was great. So I kind of knew I'd have that slot, and then I decided, oh, let's do this on Halloween. So yeah, nice. I know uh, another thing you did was you you had your fans help you design some of the monsters, right? How did that play out? Yeah, it was fun. So um, for the last video, um, I, the last kind of environment or world around the song in the, in the music video is the neon jungle. So it was kind of like a full circle moment for true fans and it like, you know, recognize the theme. And so I wanted them to be a part of it in a way. So, yeah, I went live on Twitch and just said, give me some ideas and I'll just kind of try and hash them out and draw them out. And um, we did it over the period of about like two or three hours, came up with some ideas. We settled on this. It's kind of like an antler looking guy, because if we were looking for jungly type woodland creature, uh, I guess, uh, ideas. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was really cool to kind of have their input, um, especially on the last video for the whole project. Mm -hmm. And depending on which horror movies you've seen in your life, antlers can be pretty terrifying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I've got like kind of a bunch of rapid fire questions if we could go through if you have time. Um, yeah. What's the survival kit? So the survival kit is um, what you need to make it through the MonsterVerse uh, and come out on the other side. In other words, it's uh, a merch bundle on my website, emmamagan.shop. Um so it's more of a kind of sell the experience, not don't just sell the T-shirt type thing. Um, the survival kit comes with a monster verse T-shirt beanie. Also comes with like um, a physical copy of the EP itself, which is this right here, which kind of comes in like a Ooh, survival nice. tin. Um, yeah. So uh, and like a notebook and things like that. So it's a whole uh, merch bundle. But I wanted to kind of tie it into the whole monster verse experience for people. Do people buy it before they enter the monster monster verse or is it more of a, okay, I got through it. Now I'll commemorate the uh, experience. They're, I mean, they're encouraged before they jump through any portals, <laughs> get your survival kit just in case. So they'll be ready. Nice. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I know there's probably a lot of troubleshooting with, with um, kind of tying the experience together on discord and making it as automated as possible. So how did you, um, I guess, how did you build it? If in a very general sense, but then how did you get people to test it? Yeah, so um, we, we're we a small team of three people. Um, uh, so it's my partner, James, who is also my manager, who is also my front of house engineer, sound engineer, just a, uh, he has wears so many hats. He's a very talented guy. And then a friend of ours, Al, who is a coder and programmer. Um, and we actually hired, we outsourced a guy who had experience building Discord bots before. Um, so he kind of built our foundation and then we kind of got to build on top of it and insert our story uh, into it. And um, so that probably happened over the course of about two or three months. And that was kind of post EP release as well. So it was very much a kind of activation that we brought on a little bit later on in the campaign. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how we, how we built it. Um, and uh, it was um, in terms of the, the testing, I invited um people from twitch and also the super fan community on discord uh, to test it in the early weeks and kind of give us some feedback sessions so uh, we issued out like a feedback form and we will just like be blunt with us tell us what sucks tell us what doesn't what would you like to see in the future and it's an ongoing conversation as well we have like a kind of um uh kind of bug report thing on my discord so i'm like if you come across any bugs you just let us know kind of thing um so yeah it's something that we uh, natively just lives on my discord right now um which you can kind of jump into and have a play around with and it's something that we're uh, going to be continuing to develop on so there might be like different arms that we bring in uh, add little different stories depending on whether it's um i don't know a certain promotional kind of type of thing that we want to insert in there so yeah 
um it was a lot of fun it was definitely a learning process in terms of like developing a discord bot as well um and it's also i'm aware it's a very niche thing and catered very much to uh, the existing audience on there and anybody else who uh wants to kind of you know dabble in discord number uh-huh. one and also experience what uh it's like to i guess play a choose your own adventure game uh on a forum like that yeah in a way it seems like the perfect introduction for someone who's just uh getting into discord because m- my introduction to it was more just like hey you're interested in these topics here's this server good luck making sense of it there's a billion channels and discussions and people and roles and all and with, whereas with this experience at least you're giving people a very sort of uh of confined framework and an objective so it, it seems a, like a friendly introduction to this platform for sure yeah and we have people and moderators on hand so i'll um i've i assign different people in my community if they're willing as moderators so they have the same roles as I do, so they can block people if people become a nuisance or they can uh, allow people to be part of a certain channel as well. So um, there's, yeah, and they act as a kind of welcoming, like a welcome committee if there's new people coming in and they're like, how do I play this game? And it's like, oh, you can just do this. So, and we also have just info over there so you can just dive right in if it's your first time. So yeah, I think um, hopefully it's an experience that people really enjoy and um, it's a kind of immersive element that, uh, just adds more to the music. It's been fun to kind of see that feedback roll in from the audience already, and and um, see them kind of uh, s- seeing the links between little little kind of sentences in the in the music video, and they're like, "Is this is this what happens at this point in the movie in the music video? Is this why why this is in the game?" I'm like, I I didn't even think of that. Yes, <laughs> sure. <laughs> they're like Easter eggs. You didn't mean to uh, to leave there. Yeah, that's cool. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, another thought about Discord that I think we should uh, share with listeners who aren't familiar with the platform is um, similar to the leaderboard thing you were talking about earlier, but just in terms of cha- uh, server roles and stuff, it's a, almost a way to have a street team in your digital space and like have people not necessarily compete, but the more benefit they provide to the server, the more kind of points or or roles you can assign them. So they move up in these rankings. Um I guess that's more a statement, but unless you have anything to add to that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, roles can be a really great thing uh, in Discord, especially if you um, connect your, um, for example, if you have Patreon or you're on Twitch, you can um, tie that into your Discord server so that uh, their roles appear as they appear on those other platforms as well. So if they are a tier one subscriber, tier two, tier three on Twitch, that role will appear under their name and you might want to give that category of people a different set of roles or access to certain channels. So great way to give them access to exclusive content. And the same for patrons as well. You can um, hook up your uh, Discord to your um, Patreon and any patrons on whatever tier they're in, uh, you can give them exclusive little tidbits on your uh, Discord channel or or maybe it's like a, 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 a weekly chat on there specifically for those people. You can do lots of things with it. Um, so roles are really important to kind of get your head around as well. That's so cool. Um, I know you also designed a monster TikTok filter, right? So um, how does it work? What does it do? What did it take to make it? Yeah, so it's uh, basically a, a quick, fun TikTok filter where you're st- stood in front of the camera and you turn into one of the monsters from the music videos. Um, it's uh, very a bit Halloween-y, but the whole EP is anyway as well. So we we saw a lot of people using it over the Halloween period. Um, in terms of use, uh, kind of creating it, uh, TikTok's uh, filter creator program, um, Effects House is what it's called. Definitely jump into it if you've never created a TikTok filter before. It's the easiest thing in the world. In our case, uh, we already had the 3D model that I created for the music video. Uh, so it was just a case of kind of like assigning that and kind of um, rigging that to um, the uh, rig inside of Effects House. So, you know, when you move, as the as in front of the camera it's like you're kind of the motions of the monster um when you you kind of post your tiktok so yeah super easy to use if um if especially around like a an ep we've done it before with different things and on an instagram um they have um, a similar a similar program that you can use to create your own filters and it could just be a cool activation to get um you know your audience to kind of share your content and a little promo to a song um outside of your profile and you know it's kind of like a a nice uh 
nice knock on effect if people share it on on their own socials. So yeah, effects house is um, the TikTok the TikTok one if you're looking to create your own filter. And this it's just like so built up with loads of tutorials um, and resources if you're just learning as well. So you can do it in as quick as thirty minutes. It's it's so great. So yeah, wow. that's really cool. Um, I just want to ask real quick about a couple of the kind of immersive experiences you uh, launched in the past. Um, what was the backstage Alexa thing about? Yeah. So I was looking at um, a kind of smart device um, way where I could offer my audience something where they could have a daily uh, reward. So um, if you a ask her name, I won't say her name in case I say anybody's Oh, off. whoops. <laughs> <laughs> and then you say, uh, like, activate uh, Emma McGann backstage. It takes you into my own Alexa app, and you can choose uh, to hear the songwriting tip of the day, uh, or you can choose to play a lyric game where you have to finish the lyric to one of my songs, or you can also... Um, What's the other one? Oh yeah, it's like a hear a rundown of um the what's when the next release day for the new track is. So it'll, it'll be like, oh, the next release is in thirty days or whatever, and it will give you a, a kind of um little preview of what the new song is. So with the with that uh, little project in mind, it was to kind of play around with and experiment with how the audience kind of interacted with that. Um, and if it was something that that they'd even use, um, which was it was really interesting to see. Um, and it was also really creepy to um, hear my own voice around the house when we were developing it at home. And I was just like, I'm just going to step outside for a I'm second. Tired. I'm so tired of me. <laughs> <Ugh. laughs> I, I, I know um, Music Ally pointed this out in an article they wrote about you, but it has the most hilarious like um, review on Amazon from a user. Um, do you remember that? It's something like, uh, before this, I used to be a lonely guy with no friends, but now I'm a lonely guy who gets <laughs> daily songwriting tips or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, that is a great review. So good. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about was the virtual tour pass. I, I'm curious what it was and how it worked, but did it ever happen? Because I know COVID interrupted that tour, right? So initially, like this is uh, maybe a year or so before um, the pandemic. So at the start of 2019, we wanted to, we planned to do a US tour and um, the, uh, UK government run this scheme where they um, basically fund you to do it. And I got the funding and it was all set. And but with my kind of back, backstory and live streaming, I wanted to also make some of those shows accessible to people on the other side of the world that might not ever be able to afford to come to any show or, you know, be in any country where I'd be performing. So the initial idea way before the pandemic was to be like, OK, we're doing this tour and then some of them are going to be virtually streamed. We're going to host it on my website and they'll have access to that and they can just, you know, pick up a virtual ticket. One virtual ticket will give them access to all of the shows and they can just enjoy. And um, so we'd kind of built the back end of it on my website. And then obviously 2020 with everything happened and it just so happened that it kind of it, it the virtual side of that tour idea just became what we did that year um and then of and then we managed to actually get out and do a tour in the us uh, last year which was great so we finally got to do it all um but the virtual tour pass was um it was a bit of a lifesaver in that the tickets we sold for that virtually on my site kind of paid for a, a big part of what we lost out on in um you know just uh, uh flights and hotels that we couldn't have refunded and things like that um so it was a bit of a lifesaver and a teachable moment um, in terms of just the interest we had on a virtual level. Um, that's always been a concern um, for me as a as a touring artist. I'm like, where do we where do we tour? Like, you know, we need to look at the the key key kind of points where people are uh, listening on Spotify. But what about social platforms outside of that? And you know, where is it most concentrated? And for me, it's the US and uh, the UK and Germany. And so um which is great but then I'm like sat there thinking like what about the people like in the Philippines who listen to my music or anybody else why can't I offer them something where they can feel try feel a part of that show even if they can't be there kind of thing so mm -hmm. that was the idea around the kind of virtual tour pass that's, that's cool um so I have a cynical question to ask as devil's advocate because anytime we t on on this uh podcast dive into something that has very specialized skills i guess or, or or a very sort of niche unique way of promoting something inevitably we hear from the people who are like that's eh, a gimmick or like that's 
you know, they, they think it's some sort of, um, th th I don't know how to, uh, a gimmick, I guess. So I'm curious if you ever struggle with um, how to assess whether all this stuff you're doing becomes tech for its own sake or for like a buzzwordy headline grab in the music press or something versus like what I think you're actually doing, which is something really creative and cool for your audience. But like, is that ever a concern for you? And if so, where do you know, like where to draw the line? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it becomes a concern for me when I'm just, I do sit there and think, I bet people think that I'm trying to attach things for the sake of it. And the truth of it is, if you ever walk into my house, <laughs> there is a, uh, lots of different techie bits everywhere and uh, me and my partner are just like uh nerds is the best way to describe us and we um experiment with just a lot of things outside of music as well so we've always had that kind of natural interest in in tying just weird and wonderful stuff to our music but um i will say that i'm very selective in terms of the types of things that i attach to my music so for example never have really dived into the nft side of things because it's something that you know um even though that is has been a huge buzzword probably for the wrong reasons uh, over the last couple of years but yeah i'm kind of selective in that i'm thinking with the um listener's experience um first and foremost so um for example virtual reality 180 was very much a short-lived thing um on youtube um years ago and mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to kind of experiment with um, virtual reality, um, a virtual reality music video. But my problem with that was it wasn't accessible. Um, nobody, um, not everybody had like a, a HTC Vive back then. Um, hardly anybody could afford one. Google even brought out those cardboard, uh, like the cardboard version that you could like build yourself. So virtual reality 180, seem to be like a more accessible way where I could number one do what I love to do and experiment with something new around the visuals and the experience around the music and then number two it could still be accessible to anybody um so yeah we're always thinking with accessibility in mind um when it comes to what we tie in with my music and also just things that are going to enhance that experience for for the for the user as well so um if they feel like they're playing a video game or they're in the hero shoes in a music video, let's try and make that happen. Um, if they feel more a part of the story in like a role playing game that they can uh, just come and get daily rewards in and like get cool armor in and, and play that for free, let's try and, you know, experiment with that. So um, yeah, I feel like um, it's a kind of longevity thing for me as well. Like in like 10 years down the line, do I want to look back and be like, Oh, uh, yeah, we did this, but it was for monetary gain and like it was pretty mm. short lived. Or do we want to create an experience that maybe a couple of years down the line, people might remember because it was just more immersive and it was more of a talking point, not necessarily from a press point of view, but for them, the listener, if that makes any sense. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, to me, it just seems like you like you use the word experimenting. I was thinking sort of tinkering with the things you're already interested in and the same way any of our listeners might, I don't know, get a new instrument for Christmas or something and be like, I'm going to put that on my next album. You're just doing that with building a whole world around uh, the existence and experience of your music. But then I see it as just such a creative way to promote and draw people towards the music too. So well done. Thanks. Thanks so much. No, it's a lot of fun. It's a big old sandbox. Yeah. Well, uh, what's the next sandbox? What's any plans for the next year? There's a few fl uh, thought bubbles floating around uh, with new releases in the in the pipeline and stuff. We're just about to move to a new studio, so we're going to be packing up the jungle and kind of uh, springboarding it out uh, of the box again into a new location. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot more uh, drumming content this year, weirdly enough. It's always been a kind of hobby of mine, and I wanted to kind of document my little journey uh, uh, in the next year or so when we're in the new studio. So doing a lot of that, and then with music releases, doing a lot of community centric stuff uh, where I'm recording my first live album, which will be fun, but uh, the audience will be picking the original songs that go on the album and the set list for the night. So that'd be really, really fun to do. Um, and yeah, lots of other things planned for the, for the year ahead as well. So um, yeah, we'll see, we'll see what happens. And then with the MonsterVerse, maybe, maybe uh, there'll be a second one. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> Sequel. <laughs> it's sequel, yeah.
eagerly await the sequel. <laughs> For the live album, will it be a mix of um, like solo acoustic and and full band stuff, or what's the what's the it's plan? It's mostly going to be just solo acoustic, nice and simple. Oh. Keep it raw, uh, just me and a guitar. Um, cool. But yeah, nice. Well, uh, maybe we can have you back in a year, year and a half when there's more sandboxes to talk about. But I, I really appreciate you being here and uh, sharing all this wisdom. No worries. Thanks so much for having me. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. See you soon. Bye. Bye. All right. I don't really know what to add to that except to reiterate my shame around not having the work ethic and wearing nearly as many hats as she does um, on behalf of her music. It's it's very impressive. And thanks again to Emma for sharing all that knowledge. Um, the only thing I want to ask before we close out is if you have tried any of that stuff, if you're running a Discord server, if you're active on Twitch, if you've ever played with 3D graphics, if you are trying to build an immersive world uh, as part of your music or alongside your music, we'd love to hear about it. So call our listener line. It's 360-524-2209, or you can write to podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. If you call in, try to keep it under two minutes, but we would love to hear any of the uh, triumphs and struggles of building immersive worlds to promote your music. And with that, we'll see you next week. Kevin and I have a lot of uh, great episodes well, I shouldn't say they're great before we've recorded them, but we have a lot of episode subjects we're excited to cover, and I think they will be great. Uh, hope you join us for that, and see you soon.